Welcome everybody from uh, around the world, it seems uh, already, that's great to see. As I said, my name is Peter Van I'm the Senior Curator at Quad, and it's my huge pleasure to welcome you to the talk, uh, what is artificial intelligence, what is data? Big, wide-ranging questions about the world in which we live today, taking aside the current COVID and coronavirus issues. If it was normal times, we would very likely be doing this talk live at Quad, but we are lucky to be open at Quad at the moment with our cinema program, our cafe and bar, as well as our exhibition spaces, our main gallery space in which the artist Memo Acton and Mimi Onuaha are exhibiting in the exhibition, How We Make Meaning, in two solo shows that are connected together. And the artist Tom K. Kemp, who is exhibiting his exhibition, The Polling Complex, under that banner of How We Make Meaning in Quad's extra gallery spaces. So uh, as Laura said, we are recording this event, so it will be available uh, later on as well. It's also on Facebook if anybody uh, needs to go over there as well. So today we're going to be talking perhaps for an hour, or uh, roughly, and uh, as Laura said, there's also going to be an opportunity for our audience to ask questions of Mimi, of Memo, and Tom uh, at the end. Although if there's some pressing questions that come in during the talk, we will certainly go to them and uh, throw them at each of the artists. So the, and I'm gonna read from, um, just from our, our uh, info on our website, because I have a tendency to perhaps forget uh, important pertinent things. But what I wanna do is just do a little bit of an overview of the exhibitions that are quad. So as I say, there's two solo shows in the main gallery space, um, downstairs on the uh, ground floor of quad by uh, Memo Acton and Mimi Onoha. And it's titled How We Make Meaning. It's actually taken from um, a, a comment on um, Memo's work that he wrote himself. Um, so the exhibition uh, explores aspects and the meanings of artificial intelligence, uh, particularly in relation to the gathering and use of data, machine learning, and how humans and machines input and interpret that data and how they view the world in scientific and deeply spiritual and personal ways. And Napoleon Complex by Tom Kemp in our extra gallery spaces, uh, explores weather modeling algorithms used by global catastrophe insurance, speculating on the consequences of their creation at a series of different scales from the uh, economic to the intimate. And, I, and I'm gonna ask Tom and Mimi and Memo just to talk about the works uh, in the show in, in a moment, but, um, all the artists, it's not necessarily about machines and little tiny robots working away in the gallery space. So what we were particularly interested in this exhibition at Quad was the notion of the use of data or how machines learn, how algorithms work. We like, of course, to work with artists that work with uh, moving image works, with uh, installation based works. And of course, as I mentioned before, with Format International Photography Festival, we are one of the leaders in terms of uh, photography and interpretation, photography and the research and photography in the UK and in Europe. But what, of course, we have as one of our main uh, interests and concerns at Quad is the interest in digital and the use of new media in creative ways. And all three of these artists do that uh, in exceptionally fascinating ways. Uh, we have previously, uh, a number of years ago, did an exhibition called Our Friends Electric that actually had robotic entities, little tiny robotic forms or robotic mannequins in the gallery space. And a notion of that exhibition was looking at the idea of, in its very broadest terms, our duty of care to these new sentient beings that are supposedly being created. But the exhibition, particularly, um, well, throughout the gallery spaces, uh, the extra gallery spaces and the main gallery, looks at the notion of how data is used, but how it affects human beings, but how human beings can teach those machines to be more human. So it throws up all sorts of fascinating and, uh, and, and uh, interesting queries uh, about the world in, in which we live today, as I mentioned. So what I'd like to do is, in turn, is go to each of the artists and just ask them to introduce the work that is in the exhibition. And we're going to go to Memo Acton first. And I should also say that there's a very international flavour to this talk today. We are in Derby, myself, Neve and Laura. Tom is in the Netherlands, Memo is in Turkey, and Mimi is in the United States. So um, I'm sure there's many other people around the world can tell us where they are as well. So Memo, would you be able to give us an overview of deep meditations, please? Uh, yes, of course. Um, thanks for having me, first of all. And 
Greetings to everyone who's just joined in from all around the world or from wherever you are. So yeah, deep meditations is, um, it's, a, it's a very, it's a large scale immersive installation that's very, very slow and meditative. And I was trying to create something close to like what I would like to think of as a spiritual experience. Um, so I, I think of the installation as a monument that celebrates life, nature, the universe, and our subjective experience of it. And the, thematically, there's a few layers. There's a few layers to the motivations behind this work. First of all, it's a, it's a, it's a film. It's a 60-minute film. So the, the full title is actually Meditations, A Brief History of Almost Everything in 60 Minutes. So the film takes us on a journey through the birth of the cosmos, so the Big Bang, the formation of galaxies, uh, planets, Earth, rocks, the seas, the spark of life, evolution, um, the diversity of life, the formation of ecosystems, the birth of, of humanity, civilization, settlements, culture, history, war, art, ritual, worship, lots of things, everything basically. Um, but it's very, very abstract. Um, and from a practical perspective, this is part of my research into uh, meaningful human control over generative deep neural networks. So how can I, as a human author, construct a narrative film through the imagination of a neural network? So that's on a very practical level, the motivation. Um, on a more critical perspective, this is a deep neural network that has been trained on hundreds of thousands of images that I downloaded from the internet particularly from the photo sharing website Flickr. And I downloaded images that are tagged with words like faith, love, worship, ritual, God. And I mixed them all and I trained the neural network on this. And these words that I picked, they don't have clear objective visual representations like um, cat or dog. So, Effectively, this neural network is not really learning what love, faith, ritual, etc. looks like. It's learning what us humans have decided to put onto the internet, tag with these words, and then I have written software to download these. And that's what the neural network is learning. It's learning the very subjective um, representations of these concepts. And that's part of what I wanted to convey with this work. Furthermore, I didn't tag any of these images. I just downloaded them all and trained the neural network on this entire massive mixed data set. And so what it does is it kind of creates amalgamations. It, it mixes these things together and it creates quite abstract images. So what you'll see in the installation is images, not that I downloaded, but that the neural network is generating, having been trained on these images. And these are quite abstract images, but they have qualities of the data that they've been trained on. And so when we look at these images, uh, we complete this loop of meaning making. We project back onto these images what we see. And this is um, a thread that goes through a lot of my work in these last years, which I kind of put under the umbrella of the kind of phrase, we see things not as they are, but as we are. And this is true both for machines, but also for humans. And I'll leave it there and we can unpack these together mm. in mm. the next hour. Mem Memo, thank you very much for that introduction to your work. Um, I should say as well, uh, as with all the works in the exhibition, it is a startling and eye-catching work that really draws the viewer in. And I've been able to, with Mimi's work and Tom's work as well, has been able to observe viewers, socially distanced, of course, in the gallery space really sort of interacting and, and, and getting huge amounts from this work. So Mimi, we have a number of your works that we're lucky to have in the exhibition. We have was aggregated in Absentia 2.0, which was configured specially for quite, I should say, a people's guide to AI and the future is here that was commissioned by the photographer's gallery. Uh, Mimi, can you give us an overview of your work and working practices as well, please? Yeah, thanks also for having me here. It's a shame we can't all be in person, but you know, we'll take what we can get these days. So for How We Make Meaning, I'm showing um, a series of works and all of them really consider the implications of a world that has to be made into the form of data. So I'll just kind of briefly go over a few of them and hope it's not too much. 
as though one of them, the future is here, is this moving image piece, kind of a meditation on the places where machine learning labor happens, in the, mostly in the global south. And it's a bit of a consideration of why those places aren't uh, part of the general narrative that we associate with AI systems in general. There's us aggregated 3.0 which is very interested in, it's, it's um, another moving image work. It's interested in the ways that any of us who use the internet are randomly assorted into new groups, strange and new versions of us uh, that we have very little control over. That one as well is using um, a variety of images collected from Google's uh, reverse image search algorithm and also images from my own family's collection. There is In Absentia 2.0, which, which consists of two prints is more in conversation with historical work that the data-driven Black sociologist W.B. Du Bois did over a century ago. It really addresses some of the difficulties that he faced in trying to do the work that he did and then the pitfalls he fell into himself and the ways that he considered thinking about data in the first place. And then the final piece is a bit more educational. It's done in collaboration with my wonderful, wonderful uh, work partner and collaborator, Diana Nucera. It's called A People's Guide to AI and it is this comprehensive beginner's guide to understanding AI systems and other data-driven systems. And it uses this popular education approach um, and is a bit imaginative, a bit creative, but really tries to take some of these concepts and make them more accessible. It's also available for free online. So anyone can get it if they're still interested in these issues after this conversation. Mimi, thank you very much. Uh, I should say I was reading A People's Guide to AI just the other day, re refreshing myself with this fantastic book. And it, it manages to balance both incredibly deep and difficult questions and areas of working in a really accessible way. And I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm gonna be introducing it to my daughter as well. We couldn't, we didn't feel that with the current uh, social distancing rules and so forth to have a paper booklet, which may well have in the future, uh, but we've got the um, QR code link um, on the uh, in quad gallery itself, and we've actually got the booklet, almost as this, this, this museum piece in a way, but still a very uh, pertinent and active document to use today and to navigate through those intricacies of what AI is in its many different ways. So Tom, um, uh, again, uh, work that is really uh, beautifully installed in our galleries. But as a curator with Laura, I say so myself, polishing my own halo. We're a, we've got a beautiful installation through what we call our extra gallery spaces by, by Tom, which were, were primary with Laura on screens that draw you into the space and then an installation on our mezzanine level. So Tom, could you tell us a little bit more about Napoleon Complex? Yeah, hi, hi everyone. Um, thanks a lot for having me, I'm Tom. Uh, and as an artist, I primarily work with film and narrative forms, but these narratives are always created collaboratively. And I do that through uh, using various forms of role playing game. So uh, if anyone doesn't know what I mean specifically there, it's not like a video game, but uh, something where people are generally sitting around a table and telling a kind of collective story together that's moderated or affected by game rules. So um, the most famous example is something like Dungeons and Dragons, obviously. Um, and the film and uh, installation that I'm showing at Quads Napoleon Complex uh, is a kind of pseudo documentary about uh, weather prediction and the financialization of catastrophe modeling. And uh, the film is made by playing one of these role playing games with an actuarial scientist. So that's somebody who builds predictive models of catastrophe, particularly in his case, um, atmospheric or storm based catastrophes, uh, and then calculates the financial risk. And that's used to kind of in, uh, influence various decisions regarding things like land value or reinsurance, etc. cetera. Um, and through the, the kind of, through the playing of the game, the film becomes this very deliberately disorienting set of improvised scenes where the sort of factual and impartial status of weather modeling and these algorithms become increasingly entangled with tangential personal information and kind of hypothetical anomalies or kind of exits from this system. Uh, and that's emphasized both through the way the film is kind of edited and post-produced and also the use of animation, which uh, I've introduced into the film as well. Fantastic, thanks very much, Tom. Thank you all for that um, really lovely uh, introduction to your works. Uh, as I think uh, Memo, you said as well, we're gonna really try to unpack many different elements of what you all work on. And as I say, all of you, you know, come back with questions if you have them as we go along. And I'm gonna 
uh, throw a first question out to Mimi, if that's okay, Mimi. And that one is, and I'll read this from uh, the list I have here, and I'll try and qualify it with something I've seen just over the last few days. Um, and it was, uh, this is the question. There was a, a time when we once thought machines, robots, AI, were seen as relieving mankind of the burden of work and mundane tasks. In other words, they were uh, being built and designed to give us more time for leisure. And then these, all these sort of Star Trek futures where we go exploring the cosmos and so forth. Uh, but we seem to have developed a fear of these sentient machines and we're thinking in popular culture, of, for example, Terminator. Although last night, uh, completely by accident in a way, I decided to start watching Battlestar Galactica, the reboot from the start. And of course, there's a race of beings, the Cylons, who were built by the humans in Battlestar Galactica to make their, I guess, their lives more easy, more, more easy going. And then, of course, turn on them and then decide to try to exterminate them. Um, and then also this morning on the BBC, I woke up to see um, a report that almost half the jobs uh, 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 that are around today are going to be automated in the future. And of course, there's that angst and, and anxiety now, never mind COVID, about what machines are going to do for us and what we are going to do is the new jobs. There's never this case of leisure or, or taking it easy or you know educating ourselves. It always seems to be if machines are going to take human beings jobs now what other jobs are human beings going to do and they suggested one thing that's very pertinent to your work which we'll talk about later is that notion of the gathering of data data inputting and so forth which it seems to be like we are going to become quite literally maybe the slaves of machines if, if we aren't already are but i'm going to ask you all three of you and mimi to start a really big question what do you see as the future role of ai in society mimi Right, that is, that was a lot, but it was good. But at my oh. last, last little bit, what is the future of AI in, in society? And again, going off your, your fantastic publication, People's Guide to AI, I think you talk a little bit, or quite a lot about that in, in there, but if, if you can, if you, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, we do, talk a, we do talk a lot about it in that guide, but even to answer this, I, I wanna go back just a little bit to what you were saying before, when you were talking about Battlestar Galactica, and then also talking <laughs> about this question of automation and jobs. And I think that something I think about a lot is that it, I think the thing we really need to grapple with is the fact that the story that surrounds AI systems has done, which I think often comes from sci-fi movies, um, things like you talked about Battlestar Galactica or Terminator, Skynet, all of these different things that people think about. That story has done such a huge amount of work in creating the bounds for the kinds of conversations that we can have around these systems and the kinds of futures that we can imagine, it's really shaped how people think about these systems for such a long time. So that so many of these conversations are framed in terms of a strange kind of like, oh, there are robots coming to steal, you know, they wanna kill us. And you see these, these things, they're always kind of drenched very much in fear and in a kind of competitiveness. And I think that the problem of that, even though some of those things are really imaginative and I think it is great that art can do so much in shaping how people think about something, the problem is that it is also a bit limiting and it doesn't allow for different kinds of conversations that we could have about these same systems. So even to think about automation in here in the US in the 60s, James Boggs is this um, auto worker and organizer in Detroit. And he was writing, I think in like 1963 it was, he was talking about what it could look like for this trend of, automa of automation and increased industrialization, what it would look like for that to translate into a different relationship with work for actual work for like auto workers. What would, it look, what would it take for that to be the case? And I often feel like there's this huge conversation we could be having about automation and actually not automation in terms of replacing jobs, but automation in terms of how do we get to live the kind of lives that we wanna live? How do we ensure that people can, can work in the ways that they want to work? I think these are really interesting, actually very also imaginative questions. But that's why I say like, a lot of what is more important, I think, is not just, there's the capability of the technology, but then there's also just the culture and the permissions and the context that it enters into and what's prescribed. So that is when I think about the future, a lot of what we do with a People's Guide to AI, we do a lot of workshops where we try to get people to think about uh, like what kinds, of con what kinds of needs they actually have, what kinds of conditions they would like to see met. And it's so, I have to say, it is really, really hard to get people out of thinking already in the way that I think has been prescribed for just understanding these systems. And that work, I just can't really emphasize it enough, how 
that is such important work, but it's very, very challenging to do. And as you said, sometimes it, parts of it also just have to deal with understanding the technology a bit more, which I think also gets obscured by some of those like narratives. But it is really, really powerful work. Could I just ask uh, Mimi, in the um, People's Guide to AI, there's a brilliant glossary. Could you just say what automation means for anyone that doesn't know? Oh yeah, of course, actually. Yeah, we do. I actually have People's Guide to AI. <laughs> I'm using it for a thing later today. <laughs> I don't carry it with me everywhere I go, I promise. It's just very relevant, um, but great. Yeah, automation. Oh yeah, the technique, method, or system of controlling a process by reducing human intervention to a minimum. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mimi. So yeah, it's it's just it's a, such a big, huge, massive subject, and I guess people do boil it down to that notion of these machines are going to come along and kill us. But again, what that what the technology can do for us um, and how it can be harnessed uh, in a really useful ways is still, I think, at the cusp of what's going to happen in the future, isn't it? Really, um, Memo, would you be able to same question to you? Uh, so the what do you see? as a future role of AI in society? You know, a small question. Yeah, it's a very small question. I mean, <laughs> one could write a book on this. Um, <laughs> so one thing I just wanted to say was when you were describing the question, like there was a point where um, we wanted to create these robots to relieve us of our mundane tasks, but then we suddenly became afraid of them. And I think one thing that I'm always thinking about is how obsessed we are as a, as a culture, as a civilization um, with power and control. Um, and, and there's a few things that I often think about, which is even something like a garden. You know, we think of our garden like it's the perfect square lawn and we cut the grass and we destroy the weeds. Like we must have control. We, we're always trying to exert control over, over nature. Um, over the natural world and also over other people. Um, and I also think of that, and this is not necessarily, people often say, um, this is human nature. And this is not human nature. This is settler nature. Like I, I always think of that image of when the settlers went to, um, went to the state, it wasn't the United States, went to America. And there are these photos of mountains and mountains of bison um, and I always think of that comes from an urge to control bison, or to, to control everything. Um, whereas the people there were living for centuries in harmony with the, you know, the fauna there, the bison there. So somehow our ancestors have this massive urge to control and have power. Um, and if you have that urge, you also have the fear of losing that power and control. So I think this fear of AI comes from that. And when I talk about this fear of AI, I'm talking about that fear of robots taking over. There's another fear of AI, which is a very re real fear of AI, um, which I will come to. Um, but I just wanted to address that fear of robots. Mm -hmm. um, regarding the, the main question of where do I see AI in society? Um, I mean, I'm not going to be all like sci-fi ish here, but I do think that there is tremendous potential positives and tremendous potential negatives that are that are awaiting us. On one hand, I do really, really believe that if we are to find a cure for leukemia, for Alzheimer's, for these really um, devastating diseases, that is going to come with the help of AI. Now, I'm not saying robots are going to fix it or AI is going to fix it. I'm saying with the help of AI. Um, or data-driven methods, I do think that we can hopefully find cures for these. I think radical breakthroughs in science will come with the help of AI. Um, on the flip side, if the current, um, if there's not a massive shift in our current values and regulations, I do see some quite serious negatives as well. I, I think our notion of privacy is going to completely disappear. Um, and I mean that from the sense of, obviously today we have issues around facial recognition. We have, we have things like from gait analysis. And by that, I mean identifying who a person is just by the way they walk. So you could be wearing a coat covering your face and we have algorithms today that can identify a person by the way they walk. 
And this is going to, I really believe this is going to reach levels where you could see what I'm typing without necessarily seeing my fingers, but just by seeing the back of my arm, detecting what I'm typing. This is not possible today, but I think it will be possible today. Something that it is possible today by looking at the perturbations of Wi-Fi signals of your body, um, I can determine your heartbeat instantaneously. So these kind of things, I think, are going to radically disrupt the way we function as a society on two levels. What happens when these kind of technologies are in the hands of um, authority, of state? That's one dystopia. Another dystopia is what happens when these are in the hands of, of people? What happens if I can buy a gadget that can detect whether you're lying or not from your micro features? Um, so these are things, these are questions that we will have to deal with. Another thing I want to very quickly um, mention is when Mimi was referencing the, um, in, the, in, the, in the 60s talking about automation, it reminded me of an ad that um, Ruha Benjamin talks about from the 50s uh, from a popular mechanics journal. It, it's, it, it's, it's, a horror, it's horrifying to, to even recall this, but the ad says, um, we will all have personal slaves again, but don't be alarmed. These are robot slaves. And then it talks about the benefits of automation. But the, the key point here is just the wording. We will all have personal slaves again. So in that, this is already talk, this is already um, highlighting who the target audience of this technology is, who is developing, who is developing the technology, and who they're developing it for. And most crucially, we might be tempted to think now, oh, that's the 50s. You know, there was a very different mindset then. Now we're a lot more enlightened. But the truth is, we're not. And even if, I believe, even if you went back to the 50s and asked that person who wrote that ad, like, what, what, what do you mean by this? They might say, really, you know, hand on heart, Oh, this is an honest, innocent mistake. I really, this is an oversight. And they might really have had good intentions. Um, but the point is, this is indicative of the mindset of the systems that are producing these technologies. And we are, there has not been much pr progress made in that, um, on that front today. Mm -hmm. So I'll leave it there because there's still a lot to unpack. And mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Again, I mean, I think we're going to go to some questions a little later to talk about the notion of the power, where it, where it lies, how people are using it going forward. But that's a really fascinating overview. Thank you, uh, both Mimo, uh, Mimi and Memo, as uh, both. So, Tom, uh, and your work really, uh, uh, AI, I guess you may say, I think you may have even said this yourself, that where does it sort of fit in your work? But algorithms are crucial to your way of making the work and investigating the world and weather systems as we say and it's something that's really pertinent to our our contemporary life and how it affects it let's say climate change one of the biggest things aside from covid or brexit that's happening um, in in this country and around the world today so it's really very very uh, integral to the way in which you work so can you tell us uh, uh, uh uh, go to the question as well, I beg your pardon. Uh, where do you think the future role of AI is in society? Yeah, um, I want to qualify this by saying I think I'm not as uh, specialized in my technical area of knowledge as our other two amazing panelists, but I'll, I, I think my, my interest is more in, or not more in, but my interest lies particularly in like uh, the ownership of these technologies and how uh, that ownership affects and, and biases their usage and their outcome. And there's a really, there's this, when, when this question, I first read it in the notes, I was reminded of this amazing, I think it's probably a classic uh, tiny pamphlet I read when I was younger called Abolish Restaurants by Prol. It's kind of like a, I guess a Marxist deconstruction of the restaurant industry. And there's this great bit about the introduction of um, technology into the restaurant. So if you, bu you buy a dishwasher, right? And then uh, in theory, that's saving you labor because you don't have to do the dishes anymore. But actually, if you've ever worked in a restaurant, um, if, you, if your uh, boss buys a dishwasher, it do, you don't get any more profit yourself. You don't get any more time off. You just have to kind of, there's more time that you're not washing dishes to do other kinds of work to keep producing profit for the restaurant. And it says in the, in the publication, this great line, 
we never have less work to do, we just have to do a smaller range of tasks more often. That's the effect of introducing uh, automated technologies in the case of the restaurant. And I think it's a very simple example, but you can kind of extrapolate that to thinking through things like uh, labor saving devices in Amazon um, warehouses that, that actually mean that the human laborers in those warehouses have to kind of completely change their behaviors to, to meet the standards of the systems, that, the technical systems that have been uh, added. Uh, and a, a kind of very interesting example of this is like um, a few years ago, the writer and artist James Bridal made this great medium post um, called something is wrong on the internet. And it's about like weird kids YouTube. I don't know if anyone's remembers this, but like there's a whole uh, sub genre of strange YouTube videos with, with human actors playing out these bizarre scenes where like uh, Elsa from Frozen is like burying or being buried by Spider-Man alive and they're kind of quasi-violent, very dreamlike things and they're being made specifically to make profit off a kind of YouTube algorithm tunnel. So like these videos, it's an amazing article, it's really interesting to think about how these things work and, and that's kind of um, this distorting effect of, of having labor-saving systems that are owned or produced by entities that are basically trying to maximize profit, I think is can't be understated. And I think I would agree with with Mima and Mimi, uh, Mimi that like um, the, like yeah, in terms of this idea of control or, or the garden, I think like the whatever comes next has to kind of belong to a commons or be part of a commons rather than um, mm -hmm. being being there to, to kind of save our save our labor because who owns that labor right oh peter you're on mute <laughs> i unmute myself muted myself then unmuted myself again so uh, uh one of the uh the uh, pitfalls of zoom so tom thank you so much that's a and maybe and memo as well for a, a really interesting uh, exploration there and questions and ideas about what the future role of AI may be. So, Laura, over to you. So, um, I kind of feel like this is probably a good, as we've been discussing kind of power actually, and a kind of about the ownership of data, maybe this be a good mm -hmm. time to switch to um, another question, which is kind of leading on from what you've said then, and this is to everybody, but maybe we could start in the same order. So this goes to you first, Mimi. Um, who owns data? Where's the power? And what data is being harvested? To kind of expand upon um, the points that have been made. Great. Yeah, I think this does definitely follow from what both Tom and Memo have already said. Um, so I think about I think about this a lot. And the way that I like to think about any kind of data set is in terms of a relationship. And by that, I mean a relationship between this group that wants a data set to exist and then whatever group, human or non-human, that composes that data set. And I really like this framework for thinking about it because I feel like it allows for considerations of context to be baked into just thinking about the data set because then it also makes it easier to ask all these other questions. Who collects this data set? Like who, how are, that, how are the data collected? Who has access to them? Where do they live? Who owns it? And once you break it down into this idea of, okay, there's this group that wants this thing that has done this work to try to have this data set exist. And then there's whoever falls into being collected by that data set. You start to see that all of these different questions of power and these terms and, and control, they become really, really clear. So for instance, you can think, um, okay, well this, you know, some kind of data set for, so, okay. So in the UK, I just saw this article about how police now have access to NHS test and trace self-isolation data for COVID. And at least by thinking, okay, well, let me think about this in terms of relationship. It helps you understand why there could be issues around this or why people might be upset. People might say, okay, somebody has access to a thing that includes me, but I don't know how they have it or how long they have it or where it stays or like how long it's going to live or how it's going to affect other things. I will say it is very rare, but really incredible when you can find a situation where the group that wants to collect something and controls the terms for how that data will be collected also is the same group that is composed, that composes that data set. It's very rare to find this. And when you do, it's really, really interesting because then you see that these needs become like yoked to each other 
and it really changes all of a sudden the conversation people have about whether it makes sense to collect something or whether you how much you should be collecting all of a sudden it become, begins to feel more grounded part of the reason i say that is because this kind of second part of the question that you asked laura is about what data is being like collected and that is just this is like everything everything anything so many things it's like di so difficult to even answer but rather than focusing on what data is being collected i think it's bet it's easier to think what are the needs and in what again like what context this, I mean, really a lot of what Tom and Memo are talking about has to do with just capitalism and this, like the market and the fact that pretty much for the most part, if you have data, then you pretty much have this opportunity to maybe like have some form of capital or to make money and just having it is enough. Having it can, people will find a way. This is why, you know, when it got out those little Roombas, those little cute little vacuums that like cleaning people's houses on their own, we were like, oh, they're so cute. Look at them go. And then I remember a few years ago, people realized that they were actually collecting the data of um, what is it like the layout of people's apartments and then like selling it to other companies. And it was like, what do you mean? Well, again, having this, having this data, you can always find people, corporations always can find a use for it. So this is why I think that again, to think about this in terms of a relationship, does this to me really great work where it breaks it down and we get to be more specific and we can think who who is the we in any situation when we're talking about a data set how does this who who's the we who's the us who's the they who gets to control this and that i think that for me it provides a really nice way of now being able to contextualize all of these other issues around power around collection around access that then come up great thanks Mimi. um um, Memo, is there anything that you'd like to add to kind of the question of um, ownership of data, power, and um, what's being done with the data? Um, I don't know if there's a lot to add. I think I, Mimi summed it up uh, really well. The the idea of thinking of these relationships, I think, is it really um, it does sound like it would really help concretize this these things. And um, ultimately, it does come down to as. Tom's also mentioned, as, as Mimi's also kind of underlined, the being profit motivated. Um, like once, the, the, the question I, I always think of, like why is this, why does this service exist? Um, if there's a particular service, whether it's like reverse image search or email, Gmail, Facebook, why does this exist? Does this, what's the primary function here? Is it to be a service to us or is it to profit and being a service to us is the means for the profit. Um, and as, as soon as it's that second option, then, then you know, the situation is basically not good. And it, it, you could offer, it's easy to say, yeah, this is just capitalism, this is the way it is. But for example, I belong to many open source communities. I work, I primarily work with open source software. And with, with open source software, it does have a lot of, you know, it has its own troubles. But the motive is, is not profit. The motive is always to provide the products that we need. Um, so this is something to think about when thinking about these particular things. This is what I think about. And when data is being collected, what is the primary um, motive? It's a very tricky topic, especially now we're in the middle of a pandemic and arguably extreme surveillance could save lives. Like, I really believe that at this point in time, extreme surveillance could save lives, but at what cost? And the fact that we can't figure that out, the fact that we as a society, for example, I would no way let people have the data that is required for this system to work, um, is a problem. I don't consider myself particularly paranoid, um, especially compared to many of my friends and colleagues. Um, who I would put on a more extreme paranoia level. But for example, I recently, uh, well, not recently, a while ago, Google launched for um, a thing where uh, you search for the word wolf and then you can place an AR augmented reality wolf in your living room and for that to work. And it's pretty impressive. And so you hold your phone, you show it around, and then you see the wolf in your living room. And the first thing that I thought was, oh, so Google's now scanning and storing my living room. Like, that's the, like, why? What do they need it for? nothing but you need data to feed ai without data ai can't do anything um so yeah going back to that question what, what is being harvested everything is being harvested and the reason for that is to build a predictive model of people of individuals um 
I'll just say one one last thing before I end this. I was playing with GPT-2, um, which is a language model which came out a year ago, and recently GPT-3 came out, which is um, a much, much, much bigger language model. But even with GPT-2, I was really freaked out because it was making up quotes attributed to people. Like I was having a discussion with this language model about God and religion. And it kept giving me quotes from like Socrates said this and Richard Dawkins said that. And I, obviously I can't research everything that Socrates said but I've got all of Richard Dawkins' books. So I would search his books. Did he really say this? And, and he, he didn't. This language model is making up quotes that sound like Richard Dawkins. And the first thing that maybe we might be tempted to fear is the idea of fake news. Okay, so we can, there can be bots that um, act like this. But that's not the really scary thing for me. The really scary thing is that this model or this neural network has built a model of Richard Dawkins. Now, in just a few gigabytes of neural network weights, I can ask this model a question of what does Richard Dawkins think about this topic and it tells me I don't need access to Richard Dawkins data this is a model of Richard Dawkins so what this means is all these companies that own for example like Facebook owns WhatsApp and Instagram um, and WhatsApp is end-to-end -end encrypted so they don't allegedly have access to what we type which is fair enough but they don't need access to what we type all they need is the client to build some kind of semantic vectors of what we're typing. And that's enough for them to build a predictive model of what we think about particular topics. And this is where we're going. We're going in a direction where um, these handful of companies that own all of these technologies are building predictive models of what we think on various topics. And yeah, this is not good in my opinion. And just, um, Tom, please forgive me. I know it's your turn, but I just, Memo, there were some things you said that I really think are so important that I just wanted to like highlight extra because I feel very passionately about this topic. But just one thing that you brought up, just first that idea of this surveillance and safety and that like supposed trade-off and the fact that we haven't actually had, at least I haven't seen in the countries that I pay very close attention to, one of which is the US, I'm here, is I haven't, haven't seen a very good, cohesive, clear, response from government officials who really under, understand those, like why people would see a trade-off. And one thing I think about here is the census. The US has a census every 10 years this year, of course, of all the years is a census year. And there is this, there are low, like all of these campaigns trying to talk to people about the census. And it is, to be clear, it's the kind of thing where there are a lot of groups who are like, we don't, we don't trust this right now. We, after this decade, we don't trust that the government just needs all this information about us. We don't want to provide it. And it actually is one of the times where it is really useful to provide this information, but without sort of a clear like voice from higher um, up officials that are like, yes, we understand why you would feel this way. And here are the responses so you can see what this is used for, where it goes to. Actually, there are some places where we've seen that. But if, if people don't have that, then of course, they're going to make this kind of this, this choice the one that they think is safer, which would make sense based on all of the evidence that they have, even though it's not actually the best. In this case, it is really good to take the census. So I think that like understanding this like safety surveillance, like trade-off and the moments where you're like, no, this is not quite that. It's not quite surveillance, even though it fits those forms, who, and it depends on how long it lives, who gets to use it and so on. So just that, I think that's such a good point and really timely here. And also just this very small point you made and that Tom alluded to as well, I think it's just that just in general, understanding that not all technology is created in response to a real need or even a real like concrete desire, but often just a goal of potential profit maximization. That, just even understanding that, I think does so much in cutting through so much like what's floating around when we think about emerging technology. Okay, I'll shut up. Okay, uh, Tom, do you wanna add anything to those comments? Great comments on Mimi and Memo. Yeah, that was great. I, I mean, I, I kind of completely agree <laughs> with what you were saying. Um, maybe there's something I was I was thinking about in terms of of uh, this question of like who is who is who was owning this data, where is who is collecting this data, and what what they do with it. There's in the the film that I'm showing in the film Napoleon Complex. There's a kind of key line of the film 
which uh, Sam, the actuarial scientist, says is that we're talking about how new models, how more accurate models of weather prediction are introduced into the into the reinsurance industry, and and basically he kind of uh, says that the more um, the more similar the results of the new model are to all the existing models, the far more likely it is to be accepted, because because basically nobody wants to um, nobody will believe a model that gives any kind of uh, result that is outside of their expectations. And furthermore, it's much easier, they're far more profitable and easier to sell if they're already telling the insurance company what they already want to know. And that's very easy to kind of massage and modify um, because of course you're working with like statistical samples and stuff. You can kind of massage these models to kind of create things that feel similar to what you already expect. So there is, when somebody owns that data and is, and is commissioning a kind of analysis of that data, there's also almost always like an expectation that's built into that process. And they're generally speaking, wanting to be told the thing that they're already expecting to, be, to know from this data collection, or at least in the reinsurance industry, that seems to be the case. So I think that's also kind of interesting to think about. There's this idea that all of this stuff is this amazing, truthful and insightful process that's gonna reveal these kind of unknown um, and, and hitherto kind of un, Found unexplored kind of areas of knowledge or, or, or kind of really insightful data. And quite often that's not the case or that's not actually what the people that are commissioning it want to happen. Um, so yeah, that's something that kind of comes up in the film. Great, thanks Tom. Um, that's a very like a good range for the answer. Um, I wanna pass over to Peter who's got another question. Uh, thanks Tom, well thanks everyone. Um for uh, those fantastic insights and that notion of a guest uh, who, again, going back to who has the power, who owns the data, who's gonna use it. Um, but I'd like to go now to, and we're gonna ask each of you individually, and you can, again, please do chip in uh, if uh, whoever's not talking and ask questions too. But I'm gonna put this to Mimi. I'd just like to ask Mimi about the notion of hidden labor. Uh, or the, the mass worldwide way of um, perhaps the poorest in society using or being utilized by these companies to be the people who gather, tag and categorize data. And it, of course, particularly appears in, in a lot of your work and particularly in the futures here. So can you, can you talk a little bit about that, Mimi, please? Sure, yeah, I think a lot of this does come from um my own positionality as being Nigerian and American. And so being very clued into two different types of <laughs> like understandings of the world and the global economy. And the, the work that feels really close to what you're talking about is the future is here, um, which is very much about this sort of public narrative of AI systems, which is one of like modernity and progress and uh, like this kind of future facing like movement inevitability that feels at least in my experience has often been associated with the West and parts of Asia. And so for me, what I wanted to really show in this was it felt very important to focus on people who are really responsible for doing some of the work of annotating data sets that are used by large corporations to try to be able to have their own machine learning algorithms or make sense of some of the data that they've already collected. And so what I was talking, what I was focusing on are the places, the work is called The Future is Here, because it focuses on the places where that um, tagging and annotating of data sets, massive data sets, for machine learning algorithms by large corporations that are mostly based in the US, where that gets done. And a lot of that work was done in people's bedrooms and in their little corner shops and in uh, their houses and people who are mostly based in Venezuela and Egypt. Like I think 80% of the people are in Venezuela, which makes a lot of sense if you think I was doing this project at the end, oh my gosh, what is time? Maybe at the end of, of, of the beginning of this year or 20, I, I, I just, sorry, I feel like I'm, I'm in a, like a way, I don't know where anything is. It's 2019, wasn't 20, it? Think, 20, yeah. 20, thank you, the yeah. end of 2019. So it would have been almost a year ago. And so like Venezuela was really in this moment of sort of global crisis. And so it was this, makes a lot of sense. A lot of the people doing that labor from Venezuela, because it's a, like um, a country that actually had a lot of the infrastructure, had a lot of people with the skills, have the technology, have computers on hand, but also were unable to be able to get a lot of money based on things that were going on in their own context. And so using, being able to do this work for these systems was a way to do that. And I think what I really, something that was very important for that piece is I'm focusing on places, I'm not focusing on people. I'm showing the places where those people have worked. And then I have it's this video. I also have these kind of comic book, like 
illustrations I've done and it flips, the video flips between these different modes. And what I was doing in focusing on the places where I was trying, I was trying to move a step back and not fall into this narrative of, oh, these like, poor people you know, doing this work and they're just treated terribly, they're exploited by these companies because this, there is something more nuanced. What I also, a lot of the people for these companies, they've, they've written on blogs. There's this one, one company, it was called Crowdflower, then Figure Eight, now it's part of Appen. And they, people who do this tagging work, they were writing on blogs about how actually this is a way for them to have income. This was a way for them to be able to have money when they wouldn't before. And so I was very, very careful to stray away from this narrative of like, you know, these poor people. That's why I really wanted to focus on the places. Instead, what I wanted to show is that actually, for all the novelty of a lot of these systems, there are these very clear kind of lie, like tr the same stories that you see over and over again, where living in a developed country, you're presented with the fruits of technological development. And it's as if that is just the hard work of entrepreneurs and scientists and like this, this necessary inevitable progression. But really it is built on this kind of like extraction of resources from lower, uh, from, from cheaper labor, from mostly the global South. And the fact that you can see that story very clearly in these machine learning algorithms, it's the same story that you see around so many different industries as well. It kind of, I think for me, prompts this question of what's, what's the novelty here? What is the thing that isn't new? And why is it that some of this is very clear? Why, what is that need to think that, oh, all of the work for these, these systems, it's just from machines and it just happens. Why, what is the need to remove that like human in the loop, which is what a lot of these companies describe it as. What is the need to remove that, those people or, or those places, that, that space where that work gets done? I'm on mute again. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. Now, I was just trying to also look for this article again. I mentioned it in my opening remarks from the BBC about the future of, of working. And it's so funny because it's very westernized, very maybe middle class thing to the BBC. You know, uh, it's a very sort of posh sort of way of looking at the world. Uh, and it seems to reflect really not, not the angst, maybe, maybe the angst of working people in the UK, but more middle class angst about you know, what jobs may go and what may remain and what, what, what have you going forwards. Um, and I was just looking again for this article, just trying to read some of the, the comments that, that come from it. Um, and it did say that one of the roles that will be available in the future is inputting data. That's one of the big jobs that's going to be, like everything's going to, you know, people are going to aspire to in the future. But it, it is interesting, as you say, at the moment, it seems to be really the 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 area is more poorer parts of the world. But again, I'm finding it fascinating that there is a way, maybe not quite out of poverty, but a way of, of generating more income, as you say, and it's fascinating and this is tomorrow, uh, this is the future, sorry. Um, where you, I, at first, when I first saw the work, I thought, this seems like shops as well as homes and offices. And then of course, it's people just doing stuff as they're still working amongst the, you know, the other jobs as well, it's really quite, um, quite a fascinating overview where it comes from. And the other thing I should say though, and it slightly terrifies me, although I'm hoping that there won't be any robot curators in the future. <laughs> um, but I'm um, I'm wondering um, as we, you know, as we go forwards is that the amount of, I mean, data that people have to input. I mean, I, I was going to ask you, and you might not have a, an answer to this, but what does each individual have to tag and categorize to actually make money? I mean, that's an intriguing question, I think. Um, but, you know, I always thought really that AI was about machines learning on their own. And I think the next question might go to the notion of neural networks and machine learning, which is part of your work too. But a, a memo, I think, will really touch upon that. But it's just this weight of information that you need just to do even probably the simplest of AI tasks as well, isn't it, really? But to just go back to that, though, that notion of what, how much... How much do people do? How do they get the raw data anyway? And what do they need to do to then tag it to make it palatable for machines? Just to slightly turn it on its head. It just, to, that really depends on what the needs of the company are. And part of the reason why people have to do this is that it's not work that is easily automated. You just, you just can't. It, companies just have different needs. Some companies, it's like you need to verify um, like zip codes or something on different websites so that you can then know that now things like these are all tagged correctly. I should say, I signed up on some of these same websites to try to do the same work when I was doing this piece. And I, the people who ended up, who I ended up talking with for this and who submitted these photos, they were like the top people, like the ones who were highest, the ones who were doing the most work, they're like really, really good. I 
was not good. I like didn't even cut it. I was at the very bottom level for the thing, like the tagging that I was doing. It was, they were like, you are not doing this correctly. You're So it's to be clear, it's really, really tedious. It's really, it's very particular to the needs of each um, company. And also anyone can go on this. Any If any of you are doing any kind of project where you're like, actually, I need to, I need some sort of data so I can put it into whatever kind of algorithm I'm using. You can just go on these websites. And, you pay, and pay people as well. So it's mostly like large, a lot of these, like they make their money from large companies like Spotify or um, John Deere, like the, the farming company. They have a lot of like data about plants and like image tagging classification stuff that they have done. They use some of these things, mm -hmm. but also, you know, some friends of mine do as well because they're like, I need to have my data. I need to like tag it in these different ways. And so that's, I think part of why also I really wanted to stray away from this sort of like this is bad and this is good, but more like this is the context that we're in and it is we've inherited this from other like historical conditions. It falls along these, any of us could do that work right now. The only reason I don't is because I live in the US. And so for me, the money that I get paid from it does not justify it. But that has to do also with the world order that I didn't, that I've inherited, <laughs> that mm -hmm. I didn't create. And that also people in Venezuela or like my family in Nigeria didn't create either. I mean, that's it. I mean, you, you talk about that a lot in your work is about, well, there's, there's times of racial ba um, bias, but there's also the, well, the, the various contexts of the world order and the bias against the poorest in society seem to get lumped with the, the most amount of work for the least amount of reward, really. And that seems to be coming across in the work that you make and the society that we're sort of going into in the future. Um, so thank you so much, Mimi. That's it's I, I again, just to just to say that when in my own very naive way, I thought as machines becoming more and more sort of uh, intelligent or more sophisticated that the data was particularly perhaps from the net. And, and again, this, this goes to both your work and, and memos too. Uh, that that sort of pulling of information from the net. I thought that's where it where it comes from, but that it just it's just fascinating and so evocative that it's still human beings who need to gather everything to make the machines work. I do. I find that really quite intriguing. So, um, uh, to stop my waffling, over to you, uh, Laura, for the next question, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've got um, two questions to ask, um, both one to uh, Memo and one to Tom before our final question. And then we are going to go over to the Q&A where we currently have two questions waiting. So um, I, I, I feel I feel bad saying this to me, right, Tom, but I'm going to ask you to try and keep these answers fairly concise so we don't run over too much. Um, but I'll start um, with you, Memo. So um, when you were describing your work at the beginning, and if you want me to pull up pictures, please let me know, um, you were talking about um, an artificial deep neural network and um, that in contrast to a bio biological neural network. Um, and I wondered if you could just talk about, because you described training it um, and also kind of what are the difference between these two networks and how they both make meaning. And if you could expand upon that a little, please. Okay, sure. Um, and actually, this ties in really, really well um, to what Peter was just asking as well. Um, let me just think, because it, it is such a big topic. But so very briefly um, speaking, well, I'll start with actually, I'll connect from what Tom was asking, uh, sorry, what Peter was asking with regards to um, that humans still have to perform this, this labor. And doesn't the learning happen automatically? So the thing is, there's different kinds of learning. Um, so when we talk about learning, what learning means is um, learning means, uh, or formally speaking, in machine learning, in, in, art, in AI, this is to be able to perform a particular task um, and improve your performance at that particular task as you gain more experience. So as you get access to more data, well, not you, but as the algorithm has access to more data, it's able to improve its performance at a particular task. So this is this is learning. And there's many different types of learning. Um, the type of learning that we've made most progress on in AI is called supervised learning. And in supervised learning, you provide the algorithm what's known as ground truth. You have to tell it what the correct answer is. So this is why uh, we need labeled data we need to, to give like the classic easy example um, images of cats and images of dogs and we say these are cats these are dogs now already machine learning already supervised learning is a huge improvement to how we would try to classify this without learning and that is 
we, the human program, would have to sit down and write the rules necessary to differentiate between images of cats and images of dogs. This is stuff that we can do tacitly really well, but we don't know how to explicitly formulate it. And this is why machine learning, um, which is a flavor of AI, it's the dominant flavor of AI, is very powerful because with machine learning, we are able to create algorithms that can do things that we don't know how to do or we don't know how to formulate how to do. And this is why, um, for example, we can write Go playing software that can play Go and beat world champions. And it can play Go in a way that no human has ever played. I'm not a Go player, but when you listen to like the highest ranking Go players, I mean, it makes my hair stand on end. They say, in two and a half thousand years of Go history, no human has ever made this kind of a move. It's like watching a goddess play. So this is what learning can enable. And supervised learning requires humans to label the data or some way of labeling the data. The big open question in machine learning is unsupervised learning. And this is what we humans do. And unsupervised learning doesn't need ground truth. Unsupervised learning is a way of um, basically the learning agent manages to learn without a goal being explicitly set. So this is a big area of research, intrinsic motivation, for example, right now, even with the Go, the, the objective of the agent is to learn how to play Go. We set that as a rule, beat, you know, win this game. We don't say what the rules are, it learns the rules, but we set the objective. So a big open question is, um, what should the intrinsic motivation be such that the agent is able to um, learn without human guidance. So like curiosity is, 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 uh, is hypothesized to be um, one of the interesting motivations, etc. So I haven't gone into what neural networks are. I don't know if you still want me to go into it, I've gone over my, over my time, but um, I thought this was an important thing to talk about, um, you know, what learning actually means and how supervised learning in AI differs from unsupervised learning um, that we biological organisms do. Yeah, no, I think that's a great addition. Thank you. Um, and I think we can always come back to neural networks, possibly in the questions at the end as well. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll go over to Tom. Um, so um, Tom, in your work, Napoleon Complex, it kind of alludes to what can happen when, um, when maybe data is misused or when data goes awry, um, which is shown in weather prediction models, um, which are starting to fail us due to climate change. So um, yeah, I guess, what do you think, um, so I'll go to the question, what does the endless gathering of data mean when it becomes unreliable? And I guess uh, maybe you can expand upon that through the work in the Predian Complex. Yeah, so, so, um, so as uh, Mimo said earlier, that the way that all of this works is that you have huge data sets and that creates a kind of predictive model, right? And, and in um, with uh, weather prediction and kind of catastrophe storm prediction, um, the data sets you're using, it's obviously the history of weather prediction is, is, is um, as a technical kind of procedure, it's like very storied. It's, there's decades and decades and decades of data uh, in this industry. So they actually have a pretty large data set, but of course, um, as the climate is changing, we're moving further and further into less and less predictable um, territory. So this data is becoming less and less usable and what what they have to do is kind of patch together different sort of data sets of different storms in different parts of the ocean to other parts of the ocean and try and kind of assemblage um a model of what what might happen and then the other kind of interesting thing is is that's kind of gone through in the film is that um the kind of industry standard for these you run a model 10 for 10 you run it for a whole year ten thousand times so each kind of each kind of result is like 10,000 years of the same storm happening. And then that kind of gives you an, an estimate of like what the damage will be, et cetera. Um, but yeah, um, in theory, not only is, is this becoming more unreliable, but, but of course you're using massive uh, data servers to do it. So every time you're running the thing, it's also contributing to the crisis that's making it less reliable um, because of the carbon emissions used by the data sets, right? Data farms. Um, and then the way that that sort of process through the film is that because we're playing this role playing game, so we're, we're trying to tell a story, but we're also using cards uh, and in the film, it's kind of constantly being distorted and deviated by the game, which sort of has its own very simple algorithmic agency. Uh, and that kind of starts to 
this kind of this very rigid structure that we're trying to explain about how these models are created and where they come from and what they do starts to become more and more distorted by these other bits of information that the game kind of introduces in, which maybe kind of refers to this idea that all of this information is moving further and further into less clear territory. And it's maybe even contributing to that process itself. That's great, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, so I guess, yeah, everyone who can come see these exhibitions, you have to. <laughs> um, and um, come and find out more through Tom, um, you know, Mimi's work. Um, I'm gonna pass over to Peter, he's got the final question, and then we're gonna go to the Q&A. Well, thanks, Laura. As we've been saying throughout this hour-long talk, which has gone very quickly, um, we could probably, I think you've touched on this as well, Memo, talk for probably days about this subject and not even get anywhere near um, close to really unpacking it all. Same with you, Mimi and Tom. Thank you so much for your amazing contributions. Um, going back to what my, uh, again, to my opening remarks uh, and touching on um, the notion of uh, robots, AI in, in popular uh, media, I think in HAL 9000 from Space Odyssey and The Terminator. I also saw a film recently on Netflix called Mother, where this sort of almost sentient robot raised this child from birth and became quite literally its mother. Um, you'll think, I'm thinking of Star Trek and Commander Data as this being that's just a very innocent machine that's looking to become more human. So we, we have this sort of balance between how we're perceiving, in, particularly in popular culture, um, our, our sort of AI robot uh, algorithms and our, these, these, these beings want to determine how they may well impact our lives in different ways. But my uh, big question, big, big questions here to, to all of you, and we'll start with Memo, and this may well tap into a little bit into neural networks, and you've mentioned quite a great deal about machine learning or the various ways in which machines can learn or can be programmed similarly to uh, Mimi. But if we go to this big question then, do you think, and some, one other quick thing just to, to add in, when I was doing the exhibition Our Friends Electric at Quad a few years back, I came across a certain number of quotes from uh, AI scientists who were working in the realms of AI or general AI as it was, uh, or artificial general intelligence as it's originally called. And I always sort of asked, when will a real sentient being, AI being be born, so to speak, and they'd say in 20 years time, and then 10 years later, the same scientists will be asked the same question and they would say in 20 years time. It's almost like it's kind of constantly being, the can's being kicked down the road and will it ever actually uh, become a sentient being? And I think as we've just talked and discussed and touched upon in this talk, the notion of how data is important, how human beings are still involved in that process of programming. Um, then there's a notion of, of racial and class and monetary biases and things like that that come into it again just these things alone can be just hour-long talks on their own I think really that really they could but to each of you first and to memo first do you think there'll ever be a sentient AI okay um, a nice brief uh, question <laughs> to end on. Yes. I think um, it's like that so I, I don't know what you mean by sentient. Uh, I don't know if we can answer this question without knowing what sentient means, but... Um, I, can I characterize it then? Perhaps one, uh, a being that's aware of its own mortality. So, obviously, I mean, this is, a, this is an unanswered question. We, I mean, if you're tapping into notions of like consciousness and things like that, mm. um, ultimately I can say that I don't believe in a supernatural spirit. I don't. So that's, you know, one branch of that decision tree immediately pruned. Um, so that means theoretically it could be plausible. The next point is, is sentience uh, a property of computation, which most people I would say um, in my kind of computational surroundings would maybe subscribe to the computa computational view um, such that Computi uh, consciousness is basically software. It's software that runs on our wetware. So it should be substrate independent. So it should be possible to program it. Um, that's one view. The opposing view is that consciousness is a property of our biology. 
that it's a property of the actual wetware that we run, of the neurons that we have that are not um, the, the biological neurons, which are not being replicated in the artificial neural networks. I, I don't know which one is true. I don't think anyone can know without faith. Like this is a question of faith. And I'm a Bayesian at heart, which means I don't commit to a particular hypothesis. I maintain a distribution of beliefs over all plausible hypotheses. So I don't know if a machine will ever be sentient, is my answer. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, Mimi, your thoughts? I mean, quite similar. I, I don't know. It, <laughs> I mean, I think I like how Memo has broken it down. I don't, you know, I think sometimes there's an, Sylvia Winter, who's a theorist and um, thinker and many things, talks about consciousness and humanness being like this ability, this biological ability, but also this ability to tell stories about yourself and to narrativize. And truly, I just, I don't know. I don't, I, this is one of those questions that I feel a little, I'm like, ugh, it's, I'm almost more interested in the need to ask the question than in the answer to the question, I think. And so really, I, I feel very confident just saying, I don't, I feel very comfortable, I should say, just saying, I don't know. It's, it's that eternal question, isn't it? Uh, and Tom, what do you think? Um, so I've got to finish it up. Um, no, I, I kind of agree. I think Sylvia Winter is a great reference. And I also don't know if I um, know. I, it made me think of, I guess there's this, um, and actually Mimo could probably explain this way better, but like the, the Chinese room thought experiment, which I, the guy who invented it is not a good dude, so don't look into him, but like the, <laughs> Um, this idea of like how much you can replicate uh, the kind of um, imitation of, of a form of consciousness and, and whether even if it can be per perfectly replicated, whether that actually counts for it or not. Uh, and it's a really good thought experiment, but I don't really have time to explain it now. But there was a book I read recently, a, a science fiction book um, called Blind Sight. I think it came out like 15 years ago. It's by a guy called Peter Watts. And what's interesting about it is that it... Um, it's futuristic, but it depicts uh, the protagonists are human, but they're kind of within these systems that are a series of kind of colossal and highly complicated uh, imitation consciousness, Chinese room kind of consciousnesses. Um, and the, it's very evocative in the language and what happens in the book in terms of how that might feel effectively as someone who's trying to look for meaning or trying to look for kind of um, sentience, if you want to call it that. Uh, and yeah, I read that about two months ago and I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. So uh, that would be my recommendation. I don't think I um, uh, can really answer such a large question myself, but um, I think, yeah, that could be a good way to look. That is, I'm sorry to put that huge question to you all, but I think you've all really touched upon it throughout this talk in very eloquent ways. And of course it's embodied utterly in the work that you guys create, which is fabulous, engaging work that really grapples with these really big issues and ideas and presents them in, in really quite fascinating ways. In fact, Laura, should we go to the questions now just to start to wrap up? Yeah, sure. So there's three questions. We'll see how many of these we can get through. I'm just going to answer, ask them in the order they were submitted. Um, should, should, we, should we just go on from the, uh, just go touch the, upon the one about the curators and how we, the issues and what have you with um, putting the exhibitions together. Should we just talk about that briefly, get the, that one out of the way? Sure. Shall I, so as well, in terms of what we, we as we, we, we approach how we make meaning together, um, the, uh, well, the idea is, of course, as a curator, you want to be able to, work with artists that are outstanding in the field so check we've done that um, I, I make amazing aesthetically fascinating interesting work check um, but also really as we talked about throughout this talk to really dig into uh, the very specifics of the wide range of issues to do with this this idea um, and that's what we, we we've done with these these artists and how we go about finding our artists, we could talk about that all day long and we do that in many different ways acquired in terms of recommendations or open calls or seeing artist works and, and working with other colleagues too. Um, so what we are interested in at Quad is, I'm particularly interested in, in installations, immersive installations of work that really transport the viewer in the gallery space. But we, what, what we want to do is obviously to have those works that have really deep sort of contacts and engagements and excavations of themes and ideas that we're interested in. And that's what we really base a lot of our selections on. 
uh, with, with these exhibitions too. And we, 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 we didn't really look much further than Memo and Mimi when we were doing our research with Dibby Laura, similarly with Tom. Yeah, 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 yeah. So just, just to clarify, and um, the question was, um, are there any particular challenges that come with curating the Dibbiton work dealing with AI and data? So just, just to add to that, I, I think for me, the hard thing is actually just getting my head around AI. <laughs> um, I've definitely learned a lot by from uh, these three artists and the research I've had to do for this, this, uh, these exhibitions. Um, but there's just so much to learn. And so it's great to hear all these thoughts today. Um, and I'll go to the next question, which is, um, it's a question for the artists. Do you make work with the intention of raising an awareness of the capabilities of AI and data? and or are there other drives behind your work? And I should say you, you all three don't have to answer. Whoever wants to maybe maybe um, touch upon that question. <laughs> oh, go on, one of you, Mimo, Mimo, Mimi, you're ready. <laughs> one of you go. Um, I would say I have made some work that is about that and I sort of distinguish it like people's guide to AI is very much about raising awareness and but part of I mean part of the place it came out of was I think one of the hard things and I, I mean I'm curious what Tom and I'll think too one of the one of the things about being a media artist or just a <clears throat> computational artist or a data artist whatever an artist who works with emerging technology is that sometimes the things that you want to talk about are things that like you kind of have to understand something about the technology itself in order to understand maybe the point that you're making about it or the thing you're exploring about it and i think it's really nice when you can create work that manages to like do both to be both if you don't know about it you both understand it and can see maybe like this aesthetic interesting point or whatever whatever it is and i think that that sometimes can be like that can be difficult but I think that in some of the in some of the artwork I make, I'm just more for me, it's like, oh, there's something very interesting happening here. And I want to play with this in a number of different ways. And that isn't necessarily just about raising an awareness of the capabilities of these things. But often those capabilities seem wrapped into these other questions. That is quite I don't know. That's a very, I don't know if that answer is good enough, but it's the best way I can think to articulate it. Excellent. Oh, yeah, I, my answer was going to be very, very similar um, in that particularly my work around AI um, is very research based. Um, so Laura, I mean, actually, it's, it's you said that one of the hardest things was having to learn AI. It was the same for me. Uh, like, I actually also made the weird decision to go and do a PhD in this subject um, at this late of an age. And um, so a lot of my work is very, very it's, it's, pure, it's pure research. It, it's more of a curiosity. What happens when you do this? Um, and maybe one out of 10 of my inquiries end up becoming, maybe even less, end up becoming artworks. And that's, it starts off as, as research. I wonder what happens when you do this. Um, and then some of those I push all the way to the end and it satisfies satisfy my own curiosity, but I don't see it as an artwork. Others are dead ends. Others, I see this as a potential to become an artwork. Um, and what does that mean? What it means is, in my head, it has the potential to reach other people um, and convey something to them. It might be about raising awareness. It might be just somehow touching them in some other way. Uh, but very little percentage of my inquiries actually end up there, particularly around AI, because it is such a, it is such a new area, particularly deep learning, I should say. Uh, Thomas? Yeah. yeah, I can. I mean, I think that my work in in process, at least, is is far less technical, um, particularly because I'm mostly interested in designing these kind of very analog uh, systems, game systems. Um, uh, but I, I guess I'm interested in particularly in terms of like affect or the actual like uh, emotive quality of, of storytelling or the emotive quality of filmmaking how that can be um, affected or distorted or, or use these, these new um, forms of organizing information or working with information and how, how these very abstract uh, technical systems can be um, shown and, and like uh, 
and given a kind of effective weight, I suppose, which is maybe what the films that I do try and try and produce. Brilliant, thank you. Um, okay, we've got two questions. We'll see how we get with the next one. Um, we are going to try and finish by half past. Um, so this is a comment. So it says, this is rela relation to the last question, which Peter asked about, I think, sentience and AI. So um, maybe by trying to anthropomorphize AI, we are going in the wrong direction. Other approaches such as xenofeminism exist. What is your opinion? So I do have a very strong opinion on this, um, on this actually, and that is, uh, so this is a very brief question. I, I might be unpacking it incorrectly, uh, but when the topic of anthropomorphization comes up, I find this really, really interesting. Um, and an example that I often talk about is uh, my, my dog. Um, when I get mad at my dog, um, it limps. It, 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 it obviously does the really, really cute face, the really um, don't kill me face, but it also limps. It, it actually, I say, go to your bed, and she limps across the room. If I'm really mad at her, she limp with two legs. And so I could anthropomorphize this by saying, oh, she's thinking, um, oh, if I pretend to be really, really cute and injured, then he might pity me and not kill me. I think that's anthropomorphizing. A more rational explanation might be that over, you know, tens of thousands of years of coevolution, the dog has developed this kind of behavior, and those ones have survived, etc. But the point I, I bring up is when we talk about words like sentience or creativity, um, and we apply these to systems that are non-human, and people say you're, you're anthropomorphizing, I don't think that's anthropomorphizing. That's actually liberating those terms from being constrained to humans. Um, one thing I think about a lot is that you ask, can a, can a machine be sentient? I think, well, what causes me to be sentient is that I have all these nerve cells in my brain, uh, neurons, and they're somehow connected. And somehow through the connection of these neurons in my brain with my nervous system, with my body and the environment, I am sentient. So what is there that might, maybe an ant colony is sent, because ants communicate. So I, I am made up of, you know, hundreds of trillions um, of cells. Like I don't know how many cells I'm made of, but I'm made of lots and lots of cells that are autonomous bodies. And through their communication, I am sentient. So maybe an ant colony, which um, communicates through chemical communication, maybe they're also sentient. So I think it's perfectly okay to talk about machines being sentient, talk about machines being creative. I think it's perfectly okay to be um, ecosystems of plants to be potentially sentient or potentially creative as well. I don't think this is anthropomorphizing. Um, so I just wanted to mention that, although the, 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 the anthropomorphizing machines does exist, such as robots, etc. But I don't think talking about sentience or creativity is that. I just wanted to mention that. Okay, thank you. Um, I might thank you for that. Um, that was a great answer. And I think I might just jump to the last question so then we can round up. This is somebody looking for a recommendation. So um, I'm interested in immersive art fields. And I know there are some tools that can be used like touch designer. However, I don't know any programming language. Which one would you recommend me to start with? For example, do you think learning Python could help me to use such tools? Or is it must to know at least one programming language to be able to create digital art? Anyone got any recommendations or answers there? Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have, I can't tell. Were y'all about to say something? Mm -mm. Go okay. Ahead. Well, very well i will say i just you know i used to be like full-time professor working in a department that was about art and technology and the first thing i will say is that no you don't need to know at least one programming language to be able to create digital art digital art is very that's just a super broad um field you certainly don't need to know something don't need to know at least one programming language having said that i have i used to teach programming classes creative programming classes and I have found it very helpful to know how to program because it has affected how I think about things and how I approach certain issues um, and how I approach certain problems. 
I think that always starting from the perspective of what you want to do to me is very helpful and like builds in the incentive for sticking with things when they get tough in terms at the department I used to work at at NYU at ITP we teach people um, p5.js which is like a creative computational tool um, is very closely tied to processing if you've ever heard of that which is more based on java as opposed to javascript um, when I work with like I have some statisticians who I work very closely with we use python and r it just depends on what the problem is that you're trying what are you trying to do I think is the more important question to me that's what I tell my students that there's this thing what you what you want to do is more important than just what you can do and you can actually align those things by focusing I think on the project that's very it's, it's a large answer but so that was, that, was, that was a great answer. I think that would be really helpful for that person. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, but I'm going to pass over to Peter um, to kind of draw the conversation to a close. Thank you so much, Laura. And again, thank you, everybody. And thank you to all um, uh, our attendees today. I hope you um, got a, uh, a lot from it. And thank you for your questions too. Um, I should say that if you are in the UK, particularly in the Midlands and lockdowns um, permitting, the uh, exhibition spaces at Quad are open. We're open usually from around about um, 10 in the morning, box office and 11 a.m. Um, through till 5 p.m. The cinemas are open too, and the cafe bar as well. Um, the exhibition at Quad is on to the 24th of June. So please do keep checking the Derby Quad website and our social media feeds for forthcoming events that are gonna happen um, um, until the 24th of January as well. Not only do will we have the uh, physical gallery spaces where you'll see uh, just one example of Memo's amazing works, this Deep Meditations, a brief history of almost everything in 60 minutes and uh, Mimi's uh, fantastic works, but just a small selection of what Mimi does with was aggregated and uh, in absentia 2.0, uh, the future is here and, um, and people go to AI. Please do check their websites. Do a Google search for Mimi Onowaha and Memo Acton. And similarly for Tom K. Kemp, uh, amazing work on Tom, Tom's website. And again, uh, the podium complex in the extra gallery spaces is available to view um, until the 24th of January as well. Um, we are planning on getting a 3D scan done of the exhibition spaces, which will have interactive works in it that we may well make available relatively soon. So if you are in the US or uh, anywhere else around the world, you may be able to interact with the uh, a 3D version of the exhibition too, although it's not quite the same as uh, this uh, uh, amazing immersive spaces and interactive and engaging spaces in the, uh, in the exhibition space. So I'd like to end now to again, thank you all for attending today. Thank you, Laura, uh, for an amazing uh, co-chairing of this uh, talk today. Neve, um, who's uh, behind the scenes almost, thank you so much for helping uh, us all set this up. And to our three outstanding artists, your work, you've, you, we've not looked at your work as such. Some of, please do go to the websites and see the, these guys' works. But we've really talked about that nitty gritty, the, the, the things that motivate you. And we've touched on massive themes in our hour and a half. And I think it's been a really engaging talk, to say the least. Even though we just touched on things, it's been hugely in depth and informative as well. So thank you so much, Mimi, on Oaha in the States, to Memo Acton in Turkey, and to Tom K. Kemp in the Netherlands. Thank you all for watching. Take care, stay safe and well, and we'll see you all soon. Thanks.